And my dad called me up out of the blue and was like, you still want that car? I'm like, hell yeah, I still want that car. My grandpa bought the car in 1959. It's a Cadillac Coupe de Ville. It has dealer installed AC, but it doesn't have the factory AC or cruise control. Power seats, power windows, a tronic eye that senses the high beams and turns your headlights down to low beams. It was you know, the pinnacle point of, of the big fin cars. I mean, it has the record for the highest production fin on any vehicle. My grandpa painted it about 40 years ago. That's the original color. The interior again was redone about 40 years ago but the stock Cadillac interior of that day would snag women's dresses, the, the fabric they used. So knowing my grandma, um, that got changed. I had never seen that car outside of my grandpa's shop from underneath the cover my entire life. My grandpa, he lived in Roseville, California. So we'd go down and see him all the time and I'd always wanna go into a shop and see that car. My dad doesn't think it's cool at all. To him, it was the family car. My grandpa bought it new. It was the family car. When it came out, it was a you either loved it or hated type of car. I mean, it was just an old car and he just never got rid of it. He just put it under the cover and kept it in the shop. And my grandpa passed away. And I asked my grandma, I was like, can I have that car? Can I buy it? What can I do to make sure that that car comes to me? She refused to deal with it. Um, she would not not really acknowledge it at all. Um, so one of the last times I asked her, uh, my kid, he was like a year or so old. I got her to let us go into my grandpa's shop, pulled the cover off, took the opportunity to take pictures with my son in it, thinking I'd never see this car again. Because that, that day I, when I asked my grandma, she told me she wanted to keep it in the family. I'm a full-blood grandchild, so. My grandma, she, she wasn't there all the way, and about a year and a half later, she passed away. I, I got nothing from that. I, the, the way it worked was everything got split down, right down the middle, between my dad and his, his brother. And my dad called me up out of the blue and was like, you still want that car? I'm like, hell yeah, I still want that car. And he's like, well, it's yours. He actually paid his brother for half the car out of all the inheritance and said I could have it. So at the time, I was living in North Carolina. So now I've got to figure out how to get this car there. And then on top of that, I was told that the shop that it was in was getting demolished. I had a transported big car hauler. It was, the hauler was too big for my neighborhood. So we went to a shopping center right down the street from my house. A big fence sitting up on the top of the, the trailer. Um, it didn't get off the car hauler without the first person stopping, asking to buy the car. The guy struggled to get it started, finally got it started. Later found out that I drove it home the whole way with the e-brake on. And uh, I didn't sleep at all that night, man. I tried and uh, I wound up getting up and detailing the entire car all night long. I went to my first car show that weekend and won a top 20 award. And I mean, that was, that was it. It was history from there. I, I pretty much didn't do anything visually to the car except put wide white wall tires on it. It had thin ones and they were old. And uh, I have a picture of my grandpa driving the car in 1963 and it had wide whites on it. That car has its own Facebook page, its own website, a logo. Uh, it's been on the cover of a magazine, multiple articles. I mean, I went all out on that car just because I felt so fortunate to have it. And then it's a car that was only produced in 1959. I mean, that, that's it. And a lot of people either have never seen one in person, never seen one, or hadn't seen it in a really long time. So, I mean, it, it's cool to take it out because, you know, it's, it's not your everyday car. And I've, I mean, I wound up increasing the insurance dramatically on it because I had people filming me with their phones while they're driving and I'm driving. And I was like, man, this guy's gonna rear end me. My wife and I, we were looking for a building for our marketing company. And I asked the realtor if she could show me a building with just one roll-up door in it so I could get the Cadillac out of my garage. And we're gonna buy a building, might as well keep it there. Plus I could stare at it while we work. There wasn't a building that would work for us for the, the, that specific need, but there was a, an old dealership that had a 1951 Cadillac sitting on the showroom floor. It was an abandoned dealership, purple Cadillac sitting right there on the, in the showroom floor. I was like, I can't do anything with that building, but I got time. Let's go check that car out. There was a 1940 Ford Coupe. 
in a 1917 Model T in the back building just covered in dust. So I proceed to tell the realtor, I'm like, this is what I would do with this building if I had it just hypothetically, because uh, I had the concept after a couple years of having my, my grandpa's car. She tells me her dad owns the building and I needed to meet him. So a couple minutes later, he comes by, I tell him everything I would do to this building if I had it. And he looks at me, he's like, so would we do this together? And I'm like, I can't do it alone. I mean, and that, that was pretty much it. A couple days later, his daughter, my realtor, called and said, my daddy's down there knocking walls down. You should probably go down there. I'm like, holy cow. So I go down there, sure enough. His construction crew's in there, knocked the whole front wall down. They were clearing everything out. So I was like, holy cow. So we scrambled. I mean, I went and got, uh, got the logo, got the, the business filed, went and got a dealer's license, got all the insurance, got everything. I then, uh, plus, I had to do actual research on the business model because it's just a concept that may or may not have worked. And now I've got this guy that kicked me in the ass and said, well, I'm doing it one way or another. So we opened with a grand opening car show that had over 100 cars in Tacoa. I had, I had one car, and I'm trying to open up a museum. But from that, it just kept going. I kept collecting cars, and then people were bringing me cars to sell, and I'd sell those and get more cars on storage. And the oldest, though, which I had never heard of, was a it's a 1910 Sears. You'd actually order it out of the Sears catalog. It'd come without the wheels on it, and you just pop these wooden wheels on it, and you go. There's no steering wheel. It's a, it's a lever. Um, the rarest is a 1911 brush. Again, never heard of it before. Uh, there's a 1917 Model T and an International Harvester and a 48 Chevy four-door sedan. All those cars belonged to one guy and they were all in his basement and he came in before I had fully opened just to see what I was doing and I talked to him and, and nobody would have gotten to see it. I mean, this guy, he, he loves his collection, but there's no way he could share it with people in his basement. And I've got 35 cars on display, over 100 years worth of automotive history. There's a bunch of display cases filled with automotive stuff, all of which has been donated. So I get to play and look at all these cars without actually having to own any of them. And then I, I like to describe it as a, a living co-op automotive museum. Everyone can take ownership in it and just be a part of it. And the more people that are a part of it, the better it makes it for everyone else that are just going to look at it. You know, you can store your car in there while you're not driving it. It's displayed as a museum exhibit. When you want to drive it, you hop in it and go. And that's exactly what I specifically wanted to do with my car. And so I figured if I wanted it, I'm sure there's a few other. And, and there was.